Good evening and welcome to this event. This is really a one-off opportunity for us and we hope also it's a one-off opportunity for you. My name is Fabio Gigi, I'm the chair of the Japan Research Center and it is my honor to chair tonight's proceedings. But before we begin, just to get a sense of the room, can you please raise your hand if you have an interest in the history of rugby? Okay, very good. Can you give us a big cheer if you're a fan of rugby? Yeah. Excellent, thank you very much. That's, you know, more than I could hope for. Normally as an academic, all you can hope for is really a pointed question and a raised eyebrow. So it's very nice to have a bit of energy in the room because our guest of honor uh, for tonight is Mr. Fuji Yuichiro who is the director of the national rugby team. So give him a warm round of applause. Uh, Mr. Fuji was a professional rugby player and the head coach of the Meiji University team, whom he led to victory in the Tokai League in 2003. He became the manager of the Fukuoka Sonics Blues in 2005. In 2019, he took over as the director of the national team and led the Brave Blossoms into the top eight. It was the first time that Japan had scored so highly. As rugby player, his position was center three quarterback and wing three quarterback. His son, uh, Tatsuya Fuji, is playing professionally for Munakata Sanix Blues as well. So I will first proceed with the interview and immediately afterwards, you will have the opportunity to ask questions. Uh, so prepare, this is your only chance before the big match on Saturday. So I'll swap over. So thank you very much for joining us uh, today. We're all very excited for the England-Japan match on Saturday at the Twickenham Stadium. It will only be the third time that England has faced the Brave Blossoms in a full test match. So what will happen on Saturday? What are your expectations? え、僕は日本語で喋りますね、じゃあ。えっと、難しい質問なんですけど、え、もちろんあの、え、日本に、日本から um, thank you very much for having me today. Um, of course, this is a difficult question to answer, but um, we didn't come all the way to England to lose. So <laughs> we are hoping um, that we will try our very best and we will leave the Twickenham Stadium with our heads up, held up high, and that's what we're expecting for. Thank you. So I understand that the team is already in England. Can you tell us a little bit about their training schedule and especially their dietary regime in the lead up to Saturday's match? ま、それを出せるように今トレーニングしてるところなので、え、ま、やってくれると信じて、え、スタッフもま、あの、日々送ってる状況です。members are injured so we are hoping that this will continue what we as staff are doing is that our team members can uh, play with their best potential and that is the most important thing so that's what we are working on while they're training here at this moment thank you so what do they eat did you bring your own um uh, your own cook um to provide for them is it a japanese diet <laughs> あの、もちろん両方あの、えっと、そのイングリッシュのフードが好きな選手もいます。外国人選手もいるので、あの、とあとま、日本のあの在住のシェフがいるので、えっと、日本食とま、両方あの食べてる状況です。um, the team loves both cuisines, of course. Um, some team members love English food too, so 
they will prefer that. But we have brought a Japanese chef with us, so they have the uh, they have the choice to choose between two cuisines. Thank you. So rugby is quite exceptional in Japan in that it is um, one of the few sports on a national level that contains a majority of non-Japanese nationals. Mm -hmm. uh, could you talk to us about um, the rules that apply? Who can be on the national team? Uh, so, so, あの、プレーできるというルールなので、今まあ日本でリーグワンというプロのリーグがあるので、そこでまあ、えっと、5年以上の選手と、ま、以前はあの、3年だったので、その時にま、キャップをあの、獲得している選手は、え、ま、継続
about one kilometer down the road and you could hear the fans. It was a massive sound. We really we thought, oh God, what is happening? Uh, so there's a great, uh, there's sort of, you could feel the energy. And I wanted to ask you, uh, how do you see the future of Japanese rugby? So, ま、本当に今の選手を、え、2016年から僕ら、僕たち見てるんですけど、本当に厳しいトレーニングを積み重ねて、ま、なんとか、え、彼らが、え、いい方向にま、歴史を変えてくれたので、これをま、あの、本当
uh, like top leagues in Japan. And from there, you're chosen to be an, in a Japanese national rugby team. Um, there is a necessity, perhaps in the future, for Japan to set up an academy, but it is um, it is normalized in Japan for you to play rugby throughout high school and then go into university and then go into a league and then perhaps be picked up in a national team. Any other questions? This is your chance. Yes, please. It, it follows on a bit from that, that um, you're talking about children doing it at high school. Is there any, um, any for uh, children under 11, mm -hmm. like a, a Saturday club scheme or anything so, like that? So, that's right. Like, the kids in the early days, rugby school was a lot of fun. And from there, they went to school. But, they went to school, they went to school, they went to school, they went to school. だから例えばイングランドとかニュージーランドだと、えー、まあもちろん高校のクラブもあると思うんですけど、町のクラブに入っていろんなところでできると思うんですけど、日本の場合は一つの高校に入ったそこでしかラグビーができないんで、でそこがまああの強い高校であれば、強い大学に行けるっていう、まあ、そういう高校。なるほど。Um, so to answer your question, there are rugby schools um, from a young age, but in Japan, once you enter a rugby team in high school, in secondary school, that becomes your team. And so you can't really join into a town-led rugby team or a council-led rugby team or any, any sorts. You go into a high school that has a strong reputation for rugby, and that's what you do during secondary school. And then from there, you're picked into going into a university with a, with a good reputation as well. Thank you. Yeah. I'm interested in how coaching styles and tactics have developed in the past 20, 30 years. So there was a perception going back a few decades, Japanese rugby was very traditional and other countries were, were moving on. Has that changed a lot in the last couple of decades with the foreign coaching? えっと、日本の,そのコーチスタイルに関して質問なんですけど、ずっと結構、外国人からしたら、その日本のコーチングスタイルが結構、こう、なんていうんだろうあの、トラディショナルというか、外国とはちょっと違うようなコーチングスタイル、それがこう新しい展開を持ってきたっていう。そうですね、まああのえっと、本当に、まあ、日本はそういう、まあ、こうなんていうんですかね。体格であったり、まあ、もちろん外国人選手もいるんですけど、えっと、自分たちが欲しい選手が取れないんですよね、もう。だから、トレーニングと、まあ、そういうスタイルで、えー外まあ、体の大きいあの外国のチーム、まあ、にと戦わないといけないんで、でえー、そういう中でやっぱり自分たちがどういうふうにしてその、まあ、ゲインラインを切ったり、トライ取ったり、モールを止めたりっていうのを。まあ、あの本当、事細かくあのコーチングをしていかないと、まあ、上には勝てないんで、でそういう中で、えー、自分たちでアイデアを出し,出してで、まあ、日本人の強みである、まあ、とにかく日本人は練習をどれだけやってもへこたれないですよね。<笑>外国で多分そんなやったら、もう怒りやろうなっていうぐらいやっても大丈夫なんですけど、でそれをまあまあ日々重ねて、であのもうこの勝てるチャンスまで持っていって、で最後そこで、あのなんていうんですかね、こう勝,て勝てるように今、やってるところで、うんでまあ、この何試合かは、この間、オールバックスとも1トライされたんで、まあ、そういう意味ではこう、そういう戦い方があの日本には合ってるかなっていうので、それをまあコーチングをしながらやってるっていう感じです。そのコーチングが10年間の間に変わったりとかすることはありますかもう全然違うと思います。多分あそれはどういうふうに違うんですか、えー、であのパスの数であったりとか、あとフィットネスのやり方であったり、まあ、もちろんセットプレーも、えー、日本独自のやり方で、あのセットプレー、まあ、スクラムであったり、ランナウトも、まあ、あの身長高い選手がいないので、高さで取るんじゃなくて、動きとかスピードで取るで、スクラムも低さで組むとか、うんうんうん、で8人でしっかり組むとか、まあ、そういう,こう本当にディテールにこ,こだわって、それをやってる。So what I can answer is um, Japanese players, especially in coaching, you really have to make, you really, it, it's really um, concentrating on the body type of the Japanese person. So in that sense, it has developed quite a bit in understanding how the Japanese body works. And so how, um, how like the passes and the, um, and the set plays, the scrums and things like that, um, it has evolved by coaching, making sure that the, that the um, Japanese player, players are trained really well. And he was saying how um, in terms of training, Japan never loses against any other country because we've trained so much. Um, and so in that sense, um, understanding how 
they can go against bigger bodies um, across the world globally um, has been an important mark in the coaching style and, and the training style. In, and, and that development has happened in Japan throughout the last 10 years. Thank you. Um, maybe this is a question I should know the answer to, but in recent years, we've seen many Japanese football players, soccer players, um, be joining European leagues and doing very well. I don't think I've heard of any rugby players um, playing in overseas leagues, but have they? Do you think there's a chance that in the future there are particular players who could make the transition to leagues with other bigger players? And um, do you think they, what could they bring and what benefit would that have for Japanese rugby そうですね。ま、元々あの、あの、えっと、どっちかというと今のところは海外にいて学ぶっていう方が大きいので、え、彼らがそのチームに行って何かを変えるっていうところまではまだ行ってないと思います。Um so to answer your question, there has been a few Japanese players that have gone into the Super Rugby. Um but it is up to the head coach's decision. So it's very difficult to um to, to for Japanese players to go into foreign uh, rugby teams. There used to be a super rugby team in Japan called Sun Wolves. Um, and so team, it's no longer exists, but some players who were in it um, are able to share their experiences with the Japanese uh, rugby players today. So that's a really great positive move forward. In terms of Japanese players bringing something new to foreign rugby teams, um, it, they're still in the and, and um, they're still in this process of learning from foreign teams. They haven't really gotten into cultural exchange. So um, that development is necessary, but we're hoping to grow more in terms of that in the future. Excellent, thank you. Um, there's two more questions here. Yes, please. First of all, congratulations on the team's performance for the last World Cup and since, and also for the way the country put on such an amazing World Cup. <laughs> Um, I was just wondering what your plans for Paris or for France 2023 look like. Have you determined a pre-season location, uh, sorry, pre-tournament location where the team will be based and perhaps why that area? 2023のパリに関してチームがどこそのシーズンでプリシーズンでどこにいるのか行くのか考えて考えてるんですか。It's a pre-season. あ、プリ、プリ、プリ、プリ、プリ、プリ、プリ、プリ、プリ、プリ、プリ、プリ、プリ、プリ、プリ、プリ、プリ、プリ、プリ、プリ、プリ、プリ、プリ、プリ、プ
France, Italy, and planning to be in Italy and then moving into France. Thank you. And there is one more question. Oh, oh, okay. Yes, first here. And you mentioned the Sun Wolves. Oh, I know that that didn't work out with Super Rugby, but now that the South African teams have left Super Rugby and it's focused on the Pacific, do you see any future where Japanese teams are no. back? <laughs> we hope to stay, but Super Rugby has said no. So that's a that's a disappointment. So <laughs> <laughs> ボールの速さにすごい関心を持っているので残れたらいいなっていうふうに思います。Thank you. There's one more person over there. Yes. Yes. Um, I read that a number of parents in the UK are concerned about letting their children play rugby because it's integrated physicality in the game. I'm worried about their children getting injured. Um, do, do Japanese parents share this? Mm. So, no, in the US, there are rugby that you go, Canada, that's that they have to study to come. Completely the same in Japan as well. In the professional game at the moment in Europe, uh, New Zealand, and particularly England, there's a big controversy over concussions. Um, and uh, 119 professional players are making a legal action against World Rugby and the English Rugby Union. And there are, I, I pick up similar things in New Zealand, but I, I, I haven't heard any such problems in Japan yet. Did you have a view on that? So, えっと、実は去年私の息子もその後悔症で半年できなかったですかね、ラグビーできなくて、で、やっぱりその今は日本は あの、uh, we think that it's gonna it's going to become a problem in Japan in the future. My son also had a concussion and he couldn't play for six months. For him, his body is so small that the impact was quite large, uh, it was really big. So there is a parent, there is worry as well. Um, what happens in Japan is usually you know, players would have a concussion, they'll go to hospital and they can't play for six months. And so that that's also another issue. Um, there hasn't been any movement yet, but because of these uh, rhythms and cycles, there might be something that's going to happen in the future in Japan as well. Thank you. We also have quite a few questions online. I'm just going to go and have a quick look at, um, gosh. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, there's one question asked. What did uh, your team learn from the England versus Argentina match yesterday? <laughs> Sorry, cannot answer at this moment. <laughs> Thank you. And there's a few more questions. They're, they're quite specific, so I think uh, it's worth asking them. Um, will more uh, will we see more Japanese player or teams getting exposure in competitions outside of Japan, much like Himeno-san in New Zealand, uh, similar to the question Heidi has asked? <laughs> 
する場合があったりして、あんまりこっちに来る選手はいないんですけど、うんえーまあ、スーパーラグビーであったり、まあ、あのフランスに行った選手もいますし、えー、なんか求めていくと思います。<笑> Um, there has been offers、um, that h a s been made, but sometimes there's an overlap within English season, so that it becomes difficult for, for、uh, players to be more come into、um, a foreign team. But we are, we are hopeful. There is hope. Thank you. There's, there's two、uh, more practical questions, maybe, that、uh, we want to answer.、Um, if your high school has no rugby team, can you still join a combined team? そうですね、あのえー、人数が足らないところはあのコンバインドであの出場できるようになっているので、あのあの高校の違う高校にいてだ、例えばこっち5人しかいなければ、こっちのチームと一緒になって、えっと、参加はできるようになります。ただ予選があるので、それで勝てるかどうかっていうことで、まあ、なかなかあの本当の。全国大会に出るのは難しいですけど。Okay. Um, there, it, um, so you can combine with another high school, and that's, that is a way for you to play in a high school、uh, rugby team. It, is, it becomes difficult. It, it, it's up to the high school to win against others, but there is a possibility you can join a different high school for rugby. Thank you. And one last question, which I thought was that's quite cute. I know nothing about rugby, but I'm going to the match that is happening on Saturday and looking very much forward to it. Is there something in particular that I should be looking out for in order to enjoy the match, even as a beginner? <laughs> そうですね、エディ・ジョーンズの顔を見とくのが一番。Take a look at Eddie Jones' face. That might be a really. <laughs> And his expressions. That's very important. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, yes, okay, one more urgent question. I'd just like to ask you to do that before we go.、Um, I'm very sad that you're going to miss my presentation, but the final part of my presentation is to ask everyone in the audience. Who they think Japan's greatest ever rugby player was. <gasps> in, the, in my case, the, the answer is always a Kobe Steel player. <laughs> But either his, who he thinks was the best ever rugby player in Japan, or when he was younger, who was his hero? Which rugby player was his hero? So, s m a h I'm going to be a good player. I'm going to be a good p l a ちょっとわかんないですけど、<笑>えっと、今、あの、えー、ワーナ・ディアンズという、まあ、こあの、二十歳の選手が今、からに、ワーナ・ディアンズって、まあ、日本に今までいなかった2メートルの選手なんですけど、えー、彼の、えー、彼は、高校からずっともう日本にいて、で、あの、なんていうんですかね、えー、日本で育ってるんで、えー、2メートルで、本当に優しい、本当にタックルも全然いかなかったんですけど、えー、ジェミー・ジョセフに鍛えられて、<笑>この間の MVP 取ったので、まあ、彼が本当に将来、えー、まあスーパースターになるんじゃないかなと思ってますけど。ヒーローだった、アイドル的な。ああ、僕のですか、僕のアイドル的なヒーローはあんまりいないです、ね。<笑><笑> yeah, I don't have a hero myself, but there is a player called Warner's Diaz. He's two meters tall.、Um, he plays for Japan. He's been in Japan since high school. So, considering him as a Japanese player as well, he is a gentle giant, a very warm, generous guy. Didn't tackle,、um, didn't want to hurt people, but have、um, got the MVP. So, really looking forward to his play style and his future in the Japanese rugby team. Wonderful. Thank you very much,、uh, Mr. Fuchi. Oh, is there... Okay, sorry. Yes. I was confused. Did have a lot of much kids in joint for each other? Anything against? Against the team with my in joint in difficulty for. そうですね、あの、エディ・ジョーンズさんは前回の日本代表の監督で、で、私があの,えあのトップリーグのコーチをやってるときに、3ヶ月、そこの私のグラウンドを使って練習したんですよね、もう。で、お酒も飲みに行きましたし、写真も食べましたし、え全部わかってるんで。<笑><笑>
I know Eddie Jones very well. He used my field for three months when he was coaching Japan. Um, you know, we got we got out we gone out to eat, had sake, know him very well. So there's nothing to hear to fear. Um, know him inside out. So nothing to fear against him. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm afraid uh, we have to close uh, the Q&A session here. Do stay, uh, the evening will continue, but Mr. Fuji will have to return for a pre-match uh, meeting uh, now. He has to return to Teddington. So please give him a warm round of applause. Okay, I'm just set up for our next bit because on the program now we have a comedic duo extraordinaire. Can I please ask you to join the panel and I'll put up the PowerPoint. We'll start with a drum roll. Um, so, uh, Reg Clark to my right here is CEO of Rhino Sports and Leisure LTD after graduating in modern history and winning two rugby blues at Oxford University, he joined Kobe Steel in 1980 uh, to work and play for the company rugby team from 80 to 83. He had a city career with Swiss Bank Corporation and JP Morgan before rejoining Kobe Steel as European Finance Director from 88 to 97. In 2016, he received the Foreign Minister's Commendation Award from the Government of Japan for services to UK-Japan relations. He's currently also a visiting professor at Nihon University in Tokyo. That's... And our second panelist is Satoshi Takehana, who is a rugby writer covering European uh, rugby-related topics for Japanese publishers, uh, including Rugby Magazine Japan, Number Sports Graphics, and Yahoo Sports Navi. He's also the Japanese ghostwriter to current England head coach Eddie Jones for Pressure no Chikara, The Power of Pressure, published in 2020. He also has a city career as IT consultant in the finance sector and holds an MBA from Nyonron Business School in the Netherlands. And they will be here to present the history of rugby in Japan. Take it away. Thank you, Fabio. Um, Satoshi and I are here to inform, but uh, hopefully mostly to entertain. Um, there are two parts to this presentation. One is focused really in a semi-academic way on the history of rugby in Japan. And the second is more conversational about uh, who we think might have been the better Japanese teams and players of recent years. Satoshi and I um, in this picture are in Japan or uh, two days before the Rugby World Cup final at, uh, on our way to Nihon Daigaku to make a presentation uh, far more extensive and uh, historical than this one. And this presentation is filleted part of that. You'll probably see what we're wearing T-shirts that are supposed to uh, promote my company, Rhino, uh, and the kanji is the Chinese-Japanese uh, sai, uh, and it just transpires that um, most young Japanese can't read it, so that backfired on me. <laughs> yeah. Is that what you say that's the case? Yeah, it's not only young Japanese, so is there anyone who can read this kanji? No. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of the more inspired pieces of marketing of my career, actually. Yeah. Um, Satoshi and I also, for a while, about a year and a half, wrote a monthly article for Rugby Magazine of Japan called uh, In the Spirit of Rugby. Uh, and what I learned from that was, it, it took me a while to learn this, but Satoshi wasn't actually translating what I was writing. He used to make up his own stories based on it. And I only realized this when I actually got a threatening legal letter from one of my rival companies. And I was puzzled at that. And I had to reverse google translate what he'd written in japanese which was bore no resemblance whatsoever yeah because there's what a, i uh to what i'd written yeah so there's a uh, it's about a topic which i'm quite passionate about so the uh japan is in many sense uh regarded as the galapagos phenomena so galapagos island is the, the island in the atlantic ocean which is quite isolated from the rest of the world so they even have their own food chain so the king of galapagos island can't survive outside of the <laughs> island and it's vice versa. There are lots of things are happening in Japanese, uh, whether sports or otherwise. One particular topic uh, Mr. Reg uh, picked up was the Japanese ball. 
So Jap the rugby ball, according to the World Rugby uh, Standard, it can there's a deviation. It can be you know the at least this length, but it has to be shorter than this, and in both directions. So the Japanese company are uh, sort of abusing this deviation of the uh, the specification of the ball. So there's one Japanese company who was producing quite pointy rugby ball, which is quite long. And actually, it's pointy, so it's it's quite easy for Japan. Yeah, but that players, that's yeah. not actually what I wrote, is it? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't mention the, I didn't yeah, mention yeah. the word Galapagos. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I ended up being sued by that company in question. Yeah. So anyway, look, let's just go ahead. But can you just try and sort of keep on top? Yes, yes. <laughs> Doesn't seem to be working. Oh, here we go. Look, um, first of all, if you're ever, to, I, I am an amateur sports historian. Um, I'm passionate about the history of sport, and because of my contacts with Japan. I'm particularly interested in the history of Japanese sport and Japanese rugby. Uh, the first thing you have to say before you talk about the history of football or rugby is that it's slightly absurd to think that any culture kind of invented football. And the reason I always start with this slide is that um, in the Heian era, in the courts of Japan, um, they played a kind of key game of keepy-uppy. So uh, this is a Japanese form of football. I was on a business trip to China some years ago, and um, I think China were quite aggressive about staging the Football World Cup. And, and one of my my host uh, Japanese manu uh, ja Chinese sports manufacturing companies played me a short video when I arrived that more or less said China invented football, actually. And <laughs> and actually, funny enough, it was called Kamari, exactly the same word. We we invented a game called Kamari, and. Uh, I think that's Shimogamo Jinja in Kyoto, where on New Year's Day, every day, every year, they stage a reenactment of Kamari. So I'm about to tell you uh, the usual colonial story of how the, hit, the, the British invented everything sporting wise. And I'm starting off by saying, actually, uh, it wasn't like that. In Europe, uh, whereas the Heian game of keepy up, he was very civilized and probably didn't involve any fouling and tackling. The origins of most get forms of football in Europe are um, on high days and feast days, a whole village having a semi uh, riot and kicking a ball around and getting drunk and, uh, you know, uh, making a complete mess. Uh, so there are various forms of the origins of football, but they are universal. Uh, it has to be said now. Um, sorry. In terms of the history of rugby in Japan, there are two strands to this. And it's pretty obvious that there's two strands. Number one is when did rugby first be, when was it first played in Japan? And secondly, when did Japanese people start playing it? And the obvious answer to the first question is uh, in the early, in the mid 1860s. This is a very famous print from the Illustrated London News of 1874. And it's a rather stylized picture of um, foreigners playing rugby on the bluff in Yokohama, you can see Mount Fuji from lots of parts of Yokohama, but that's a bit stylized. And obviously the locals are watching and the sailors and soldiers and expats are playing. And the Yokohama Football Club, if you look at the flag, you can make out the fact that it's YFC, the Yokohama Football Club. Uh, and the reason I'm gonna mention that is that, um, I'll get it right eventually. The story of, the origins of rugby in Japan is interesting insofar as the Yokohama Football Club has been proved to be the or, uh, the uh, which merged seamlessly into a club called the Yokohama Country and Athletic Club. This is a gentleman called Mike Galbraith, who's a great friend of mine and is a, another amateur historian who currently is writing a book on the history of rugby in Japan. And I must, at this point, as this is being recorded, pay tribute to Dr. Helen McNaughton, who's a very good friend of mine from SOAS, who would be here but she's in New Zealand at the moment, amongst other things, watching the Women's Rugby World Cup. I saw her 10 days ago. She is currently writing jointly with Mike, a history of Japanese rugby. And the history of Japanese rugby in a real sense starts in the mid 1860s, and it makes the Yokohama Country and Athletic Club the oldest continuously surviving rugby club in Asia, uh, which is, I think, Phil McGowan's here. Uh, if you want to claim anything in rugby, you have to get Phil, who's the curator of the World Rugby Museum, to agree to it. And finally, Mike uh, convinced Phil that this was the case. So rugby started in Japan in the 1860s, and their club in Yokohama is the oldest um, continuously surviving rugby club in Asia, which I think is very nice. But of course, 
in the past, I have to say, Japanese rugby historians and officials were really not mad keen on that story because really for them, the only thing that mattered was when did rugby start in Japan? And the story is, and the answer is here. So what you have there is 1899, Keio Gijuku or Keio University uh, have the first ever Japanese rugby team. And it's founded by the two guys in the middle, very interesting background. The guy on the left is Edward Bramwell Clark, who uh, had an English father who was a baker in Yokohama, I believe, and a Japanese mother. And he went from Yokohama somehow to the University of the West Indies, which I've never managed to understand, but then on to Cambridge, where he met the guy on the right, Gynosuke Tanaka. Uh, so they met at Cambridge. And somehow they ended up both teaching together at Keio. And they decided that they'd, um, they'd uh, get the guys together for a team. The first ever team they played was the Yokohama Country and Athletic Club. There's no one else to play. But this is the first team. And I think I just love this photograph because it's very, it's taken a lot of staging, the two sort of mentors in the middle. But if you look at, look at the physique of those guys, I just think the idea that the Japanese have a physique unsuited to rugby. Look at those blokes. I mean, they just... They look to me to be made for rugby. And I love the way that they've been taught to sort of look into the distance with their arms folded, like you see in all sort of <laughs> Victorian photographs of that era. So rugby starts 1899 onwards in the 1910s. Uh, it, it's, you know, it begins to make some progress. But the next great leap forward in Japanese rugby uh, history is presided over by this gentleman called Shigeru Kayama. And he was obviously a rather aristocratic background, I have to presume, because he went on tour of, of the world and Europe with the future Emperor Hirohito when he was crown prince in the 1920s. And amongst other things, he certainly trained and played with Harlequins and Richmond and came back to Japan and wrote the definitive book uh, on rugby called Rugby, which was not just about these are the rules. It was about this is the ethos of the game. And it was decided by the powers that be that actually we quite like the idea of using rugby in our educational system. Um, and one of the theories that my colleagues at Nihon University in Tokyo uh, have is that there was actually a confluence of ideas between the way that the Japanese thought about sport and the world and uh, the way that the English did. So this is a very well-known book by Nitobe Inazo, Bushido, the soul of Japan, which is a massive seller in the West when the West was very interested in learning about Japan in the 1890s. And the theory of some people is that um, the idea of manliness and chivalry and man way of behaving that was shown, for example, in Tom Brown's school days, which was published in the 1850s, rather meshed. So I certainly think that the people who were in charge of education in Japan thought, well, Actually, we like the values of rugby, um, and it chimes with you know our natural way of looking at things. A nice story I like to tell about the history of Japanese rugby is that uh, Shigeru Kayama designed the first ever Japanese rugby jersey, and you'll see that the th there are three cherry blossom flowers, and one of them is an unopened bud. And Kayama's idea was that that bud, bud would stay. Uh, closed until such a time as Japan could consider itself on a par with the rest of the world. And so that, I think, is, um, Phil, the earliest known surviving rugby jersey. Is, is that from one that you've had in the museum, I think? Anyway, it, yeah, 1932, it illustrates the point, just to show the difference. That's the modern one on the right, and you see the one on the left. Now, interestingly, the point at which they decided to uh, opened the third bud was when Oxford University toured Japan in 1952, the first ever foreign sports team to tour after the Second World War. And they played Japan and they decided, rightly or wrongly, that that, that, equal, that represented equality. So the third blossom was allowed to, um, was allowed to open. So an, another small anecdote about uh, the history of Japanese rugby, which I quite like, is that Shigeru Kayama befriended uh, a gentleman called Edmund Blunden uh, at Tokyo University. So I think Kayama went back to teach at Tokyo University. And Edmund Blunden is one of our most famous and revered war poets who survived the trenches of the First World War and went to teach English at Tokyo University and became a great friend of Kayama. 
And he wrote this poem. It's not his best poem, I suspect. I'll try and read the first verse to you if I can, in case you can't. I hear from time, I hear from winters long ago, resounding to the frosty sky, the shouts of feet, feet, feet go low, the splendid roar that hailed the tribe. I hear from winters yet to come, those old dad car cries from throats hurled, and feel when you and I are dumb, still rugby will refresh the world. Now, I think it's a very nice line, still rugby will refresh the world. And uh, the interesting thing is that this is now the rugby club song of Tokyo University. So if you go to a, a Todai game, uh, the teams all get together afterwards in a rather stylized way. They have a beer, they have a snack, and they sing their rugby club song against each other. And if you're first listening to this one, after a few minutes, you think, actually, that's English that they're <laughs> trying to sing. And that's what they sing. Now, the interesting thing is in the 1930s, at the time when uh, uh, Japan uh, went extremely nationalistic and were not necessarily uh, uh, in favour of foreign words and concepts, um, rugby temporarily became known as Tokyo, which is fighting ball. So rugby was dropped and they were playing a game called Tokyo. Uh, and I, whenever I bumped into some old guys from... Tokyo University, I said, well, presumably in that era, you dropped your rugby club song because it was in English. And of course they didn't. They kept singing it in English. I think this is quite a fun thing to, to, to look back on. So that's, there's a few sort of strands that I plucked out from a much longer lecture on the history of rugby in Japan. Uh, and that leads us really up to the, the Second World War. And I want to next talk about um, the time since then, since 1945. But Satoshi, have you got any sort of things to come in on there that you want to? Uh, what? So what was the question? Was have you got any <laughs> points to make at this point? <laughs> so any, any more to add? Uh, yes. Um, yes, he is the one who wrote the, the school song for the Tokyo University. Then he has got uh, quite lots of connection with Japan. And uh, he's actually kind of a known figure in a certain circle among the uh, Tokyo University rugby team. So that... Yeah, he's very, yeah, the Todai is much revered in, in Tokyo University. Yeah. And his, uh, his ancestors, his ancestors, yeah. his, uh, his relatives now are still very aware of, of his role in that. Now, that's the sort of a snapshot of a much longer lecture on the history of rugby in Japan, which I hope you found interesting. And I was thinking about how to approach rugby since the war in Japan. And I think the, uh, I'm going to do something very straightforward. This is from Wikipedia. So anyone, anyone can look at this. The, the story of rugby in Japan since 1945, 50 is all about company rugby. So there's a very you know, interesting question. Why is company rugby so dominant in Japan? And in the so-called amateur era of rugby prior to 1995, this was quite tricky really, because the Japanese say, yes, we, you know, we're rugby's an amateur game. And they'd say, well, yeah, but, you know, you've got company rugby teams and the company teams are recruiting people like me really to play rugby, even though you had to work. That was a that was a delicacy that was that was well managed uh, by Japan, the JRFU. Uh, but the fact is, it's still dominated by companies. I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it's a reflection really on Japanese society. Less so now, but in the certainly in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. If you joined a Japanese company, it dominated your life. It wasn't, you know, you know if, if you played squash or badminton, it was for the company team. Everything you did was to do with the company. So the fact you played for the, the, the company team, no big, no, no big deal. It's the same as rugby for everything else. The other big factor, I think, really was, was land. And I think the absence of playing fields uh, and land on which to build stadiums, being a an under-recognized part of the history of sport in Japan. So the, one of the reasons that company teams dominated the post-war scene was that certainly the, the big steel companies and the railway companies had land on which they could easily put a rugby pitch. Um, and it was very different for other, you don't get sort of, re, you don't get neighborhood teams in Japan. There just isn't a place to play. You do get them, but it's hard work for the people uh, who were involved in that. So. I'm going to ask two questions to finish off the lecture, and then I really want to, to um, get other people's opinion, as not just Satoshi's. Um, and the question is, who was the best ever team that Japan ever had? Um, and who was the best ever player that Japan ever had? So these are my two questions to finish with. And we're going to scroll through 
these stats. Um, so if you look at that, I would point out there's um, in the early days when it was the NHK Cup for three years, three years in five, a team called Yawata Steel, which is based in Kitakushu, uh, was still an independent company then, it, but then became Shinitetz Yawata, as it still is. And at that time, from 1960 to 61, all the way through to 1997, 98, the format in Japan was that they'd have a company championship and then they'd have a university championship. And the company team would play the university team in the national stadium, usually on a big national holiday, and at certain times with very big crowds so for the championship. Now, the fact is that I would say seven or eight, possibly more times out of 10, the company team used to win because the university team was obviously younger. Um, but it was a nice concept and it lasted all the way through, as I say, to 97, 98. Now, if we scroll, scroll down here, you come into a period where a different Nippon Steel team from Kamaishi uh, in Sendai, correct? Uh, and, yes. Um, had a fantastic team. Uh, and it was quite odd because it's quite an isolated town, but the Nippon Steel Kamaishi team did very well. Then you come actually to the most exciting part for me when the Kabelko Steelers start winning a great deal. And in recent years, Toshiba Futsu did very well, three wins in a row. And then more modern, in, you come into a period where the Sanyo Wild Knights, which became Panasonic Wild Knights, have done rather well, as you can see. And Suntory Goliath, Eddie Jones's team, win three in a row and then two here. And I think he has been involved in all of those teams as an advisor. Um, and you can see Panasonic re recently won. So we have the question, and I would welcome input onto this. So who was the best Japanese team ever since the war? Uh, Yawata Steel, Nippon Steel Kamaishi, Kobe Steel, Wasada, Toshiba Futsu, Sanyo Panasonic, Suntory. The reason I put Wasada in there was because they were the last ever university team under the old dispensation to win the championship. Um, and at this point, I would just uh, say we're here today um, because it's the England-Japan game on Saturday, but I've put in front of you a programme for an event that's very close to my heart, the Oku Memorial Trophy. Katsu Oku was a very distinguished Wasada University player and uh, administrator who's widely regarded as the person who first had the idea that Japan should pitch for a World Cup. He sadly was, as you may know, assassinated in Iraq in 2003, and every year we play this match, usually at the end of November, but if England and Japan are in town, we play it the same day. So have a look at the programme. You'd all be very welcome to attend that. The reason I mention it is that um, a quite famous coach in Japan called Kiyomiya-san and um, Katsuoku together put together what, is they, what most people consider the best ever Japanese university side, which was the team that, if we look back, whoop, in the last Wasada, the last. No, hang on. Sorry, bear with me. The last ever university team to win was Wasada somewhere. Yeah, yeah. That was a very famous team in Wasada. And they, they had a philosophy called the ultimate crush. I don't know what that means. But um, I think it's worth at least including one university team in, in the best ever team. So, you know, who was the best ever team? In my opinion, of course, it, if you think about it statistically, 10 wins and seven consecutive wins has to be Kobe Steel, really. But other people might have a different view. Satoshi, what do you think? Oh, well, yeah, definitely Kobe Steel, yes. You agree? Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's no good. Yeah. <laughs> As someone who knows absolutely nothing about Japanese, you know, oh, sorry, corporate and university rugby, at what stage did those teams start having foreign players in them? Foreign players? Yes. Yeah, okay. Well, without, without <laughs> blowing my own trumpet, I was the first foreigner to play top-level rugby in Japan for Kobe Steel for three seasons, for 80 to 83. It then became a bit of a landslide, especially in the 90s. So those ones at the bottom there, they all had... Did they have Huge. mainly well, mainly international teams? Well, I, the, the good thing about the Japan top league or whatever it's called, first division, mm -hmm. is that there is a limit on foreign players. 
both um, the number you can have on the books and the number on the field at any one time. Now, in, until recently, it used to be three on the pitch. Are there, what's the current rule, Satoshi? Do you know? Uh, well, yeah, there are some caps, yes. Uh, I don't know how many. <laughs> <laughs> it's more than three, but they, they, they kept the limit on it because, you know, otherwise, it, what does it do to develop the, the, the game? The first non-Japanese player ever to play rugby for Japan was a guy called Payone. And he was a Tongan who went to Daito Bunker University. And I think he played for Japan in 86, 87. And since then, uh, my final slide is of Dan Carter, who played for Kobe Steel. I mean, that tells you all you need to know. I think these days, <clears throat> because of the seasonality, it's possible for very uh, for leading players, especially from New Zealand, Australia, and to a less extent South Africa, they can actually play in the European season for half a season and play in the Japan league and um i won't go into detail but the money is phenomenal i mean the japanese corporate teams are playing phenomenal amounts of money to foreign players uh and you know the dream scenario at the end of a, a distinguished career certainly in new zealand possibly south africa and australia is to end up you know, playing half the season in in japan and half the season in europe it's that's that's your payday so again, I'm very biased as to as to what the answer to that is. But you know, that's the scene in Japan. It's corporate dominated. Well, that's you know nothing wrong with that. After the World Cup, there was an attempt to try and make a more franchise based model for a top league. So, for example, Oita was a huge success as a venue in the Rugby World Cup, and they thought, well, let's create a franchise in Oita. But this involved going to Kobe Steel and saying. Would you mind just dropping out and let, letting the team be Kobe and going to Toyota and saying, can we have a Nagoya team? And just, you know, and of course, you know, the answer from to, to, you know, Kobe Steel and Toyota was um, no, no, we, we quite like our rugby team. So the, the power of the corporate saw off, off that attempt to make it more city, regional, franchise based. And I don't have a view on whether that's good or bad. I mean, I, I just think the system is what it is. I think it works in Japan on a corporate basis, and it's been in place for decades, and I think you should you know, be wrong to tamper with it. So there you are. That's teams. So who was Japan's best ever player? So this is Reg's list, and Satoshi's got his own list. So these are this is actually much neglecting recent years and is really focused on times that I played. So... There's a gentleman called Demi Sakata who, remarkably, uh, he played at Kintetsu in Osaka and for All Japan. He went to New Zealand for a couple of years and actually almost got selected for the All Blacks. He was a winger. He was that good. A guy called Hiro Shukazawa, who was a very famous university player, who instead of joining a company team like Kobe Steel or Nippon Steel, joined Sumitomo Bank and continued to captain the Japanese team by training on his own and not playing for a club team, which was remarkable. A guy called Yuji Matsuo, who I played against, uh, incidentally, Hiro Shukazawa was one of the founders of London Japanese Rugby Club, and I remember playing with him uh, to my great pleasure. Yuji Matsuo was a great fly half for Nippon Steel, who always hammered us when we played them, and I've never forgiven him, but there you go. Toshiyuki Hayashi, at one time I would have said Japan's greatest ever forward, first Japanese national to get a rugby blue at Oxford. Seiji Hirao was an absolutely fantastic player for Kobe Seiko and Japan, who'd sadly died too early um, of cancer a few years ago, but world-class. And more recently, the star of the 2015 Rugby World Cup, Ayumu Gorumaru, who certainly played some super rugby. Um, and Michael Leach, I think it's a remarkable, I, I've picked all Japanese nationals, but I think of Michael Leach is a fantastic story. He's born in New Zealand of Fijian heritage moved to Hokkaido when he was 11. And um, as far as I'm concerned, as, you know, is, is as Japanese as he could be in, in, re in a real sense. And I would say in the last 10 years, there have been many, many years in which I put him as one of the top five players in the world. In the last game at Twickenham between England and Japan in, in 2018, he was unbelievably good. But my, my cultural favourite clip of a Japanese rugby team in the changing room uh, is Michael Leach at the centre of the room, surrounded by the players, delivering his pep talk in perfect Japanese. Mm -hmm. And they have translators around the room translating it back into English for the non-Japanese players, which I just think is a fantastic mm -hmm. sort of cross-cultural glimpse. So 
Um, this is my list. So Hiro Shukuzawa, Demi Sakata, Matsuo san in his action shot, he runs a bar in Shibuya, which I go to every time I'm in Tokyo, and he still hasn't bought me a drink. <laughs> Maru Hayashi, great player. Goro Maru, Michael Leach, and Seiji Hirao. Now, uh, what do you think, Satoshi? You've mentioned a couple of guys more recently who've played in Super Rugby. Uh, yeah, the uh, Kotaro Matsushima or the Kazuki Himeno. So those players played uh, abroad in recent days. So, so they must be... Which ones in particular? Uh, I don't know, both of them. I think one back. Just one. mention their names again. Yeah, Kotaro Matsushima. He played for the uh, Claremont. Okay, Claremont over there. Yeah, then the Himeno played Highlanders. For the Spy, uh, okay. Spy Rugby, so. Is anyone else up there got another candidate that you'd put forward as Japan's greatest ever player? Oh, yes, the winger. Yeah, the record try scorer. Yeah. yeah, I should have put him in, actually. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, he'll never forgive me. Don't tell him. <laughs> Anybody else? Any ideas? Thank you, Fukuoka. Oh, yeah, that's good point. yeah, the winger, yeah. He didn't play abroad, but he played really well for the World Cup yeah. for Japan. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'm by, I, I, this is heavily weighted towards... Last, I'm, I haven't been very good on the last 10 years. Just go back 30 years. Before, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's, <laughs> that's the era that I live yeah, yeah. in, I'm afraid. So, okay, well, this is, I mean, <laughs> you won't be surprised. I'm going to actually, I'm going to have one Sorry, concept. You missed Matthew. Sorry? Matthew. Yes. Oh, yeah. Number Matthew, eight. Yeah, yeah. yeah, he had a fantastic World Cup in 2015. I agree. Well, here's, my, here's mine. So having, having nominated Kobe Steel as the best ever team in Japan, uh, I would normally have said in the past, Maru Hayashi was Japan's best ever forward. And I have to say now, I really think that has to go to Michael Leach. So it's not all going to be, it's not all Kobe Seiko. So he's a great player. But Michael Leach, I just think as a captain and a player has just been unbelievable in the last 10 years. So he's got my vote for Japan's best ever forward. But I, I have to say that I still think Japan's best ever back and player was Seiji Hirao. I think he was just in a different league. So you have to have a reward for giving a lecture. And the next two slides are a complete indulgence to myself. <laughs> so I'm very fond. I was fond of Seiji Hirao. We played together for Richmond in the in 1985, 86, in the middle of his career. Yeah, a bit of hair there and, at uh, the time. <laughs> and um, I, I was very moved. One of my top experiences in the Rugby World Cup uh, in Japan was actually not watching a match in the stadium. I watched um, Ireland play Japan in, in the, the Kobe fan zone, which was on the waterfront in Kobe. And it was actually just a fantastic experience, as good as being in the stadium. But there was a whole um, uh, exhibition or memorial to Seiji Hirao, um, 20, 30 yards of pictures of him, and which, which, which really moved me, actually. So that's a picture of me... Um, paying tribute to my, my old mate. He's sickeningly good looking, actually. Um, he, he was the David Beckham of Japan when he, when he uh, first arrived. And finally, who was the greatest rugby player ever to play in Japan? I think it was Dan Carter, who was my Kobe Seiko Kohai. Yeah, I was very, a bit over here there as well. I was very pleased to meet him when he became the latest Gaijin fly half for Kobe Steel, which I was very proud to do in 1883. So that's my self-indulgent lecture on the history of rugby in Japan, and I'd be very happy to take any questions. Do I didn't involve you very much. I'm so yeah, sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I well, it's, mostly I do, it's mostly because I don't trust you, actually. <laughs> any questions? If you worked for Toyota, say, and you played for the company team, how do you balance your career? And does the company pay you for playing rugby as well? That's a, that's a very, very good question. And the, the answer's changed over the years. So um, let me give you the up-to-date answer as of now. Both Kobe Steel and Toyota and all of the other professional teams in Japan would have two kinds of players. One is pure professional. And all of the foreign players are just professional rugby players. They're not expected to work. And they have a type two, which is people who are, are, who are actually earmarked to stay in the company and they will be given time off to train. But unlike their other players, some you know, full time professional Japanese, all of the foreigners, they would train and then have to go off and work in the afternoon. So all of their colleagues working around them would know 
that, you know, three afternoons a week, they won't be here because they'll go and train. So I think that's a nice two tier system because it gives you the ability to exploit your rugby ability, but still lay down the foundations of a proper career in the company. And, ge and genuinely, if these people are good, they won't be dis discriminated against as, as jocks or, you know, sportsmen in future. They can make it. Now, if you come back to my time on uh, joining Kobe Steel, would deliberately recruit good um, Japanese graduates, obviously, good rugby players, uh, and it's starting with myself, foreigners, but we had to work nine till five. There's no question about it. You know, nine till five and training Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday afternoon and playing on a Sunday. Wasn't a great life, I have to tell you, when I was there. No, seriously, it was tough. Um, but it was great and it was fantastic. But they kind of, that's the way it's evolved. But it's a very good question, I think. Yeah. How would you say the corporate nature of uh, Japanese rugby has affected the development of fan bases and uh, support teams compared to a more local or regional? I, I think that I think that is a negative, um, not a huge negative, but I mean, um, Kobe Steel. I think there might be now a um, Oryx baseball team in the Kobe area, but Kobe Steel was the only national ranking sports team in Kobe. So. Kobe Steel would get a lot of support from the region of Kobe, but I don't think there's, it's an automatic fit in other places. And I think the proponents of a new top league that was regional city franchise base were hoping that that would, that would create a bigger fan base. And I think it would have done. You know, it's one of those, I think that is the downside of the corporate thing. You might, you might live in Toyota and you might live in Nagoya and not like Toyota. You know, you might live in Kobe and think Kobe Seiko is an awful company. So you are restricting yourself, but swings and roundabouts, really. Yeah. Uh, just building on that question, I, uh, I wonder if the uh, company is deep down, women's, women's team, because uh, I suppose without uh, build with that model, without um, women's teams from the company, then I suppose that's also restricted. Yeah, look, the, the women's game is, is very underdeveloped at the grassroots uh, level in Japan, the the Japanese national sevens uh, women's team are very good at the moment, and the fifteens are getting there. But the player base is very small. There were only, I think, I'm right in saying only two professional or even semi professional teams, maybe three in Japan. So I think where uh, the women women's rugby is one of the big growth areas of world rugby. I think I think numbers wise, it's still struggling in Japan. They managed to field some good national teams, but there's not much below there. I mean, I think, um, I'm trying to think of the, the professional teams in, they certainly, and they're not corporate. The, the top women's teams are not corporate. They're, they're, um, they're sort of open clubs like we have uh, elsewhere. Shibuya Ladies was a very good team. And there was two or three others, I think. Satoshi, do you, do you know that? Or not? Yeah, there are some, yeah, clubs that are, that are corporate there. But they're not, but they're just open clubs, aren't they? I think so, yes. But, yeah. It's two minutes past sake time, so I'm very happy to turn it <laughs> I think yes. So thank you very much. Give a big round of applause for our speakers, Reg and Satoshi. And you can find them outside. Um, so now I would like to thank our sponsors, uh, Rie Yoshitake of Sake Samurai, who is already outside preparing the sake reception to which you are cordially invited. And of course, uh, the Japan Society, um, who also helped with the catering. And there should be some sushi waiting for you just outside the room. So thank you to Heidi Potter of the Japan Society. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. And I hope you enjoyed the evening. And please join us outside.